So all of you should have received in the email from the Bodies the uh, new batch of handouts that I've created for you in the last week, uh, beginning with 58. So you should have a batch there that takes you through Amos 9. And then after we conclude Amos, we'll go and catch Obadiah. Obadiah is a very short book. If you blink, you'll miss it. It's just a couple pages in your Bible. So we'll do a couple weeks of that, and then we'll move on to Jonah. And after we do Jonah, then we'll, uh, we'll gather together and decide where we want to go from there. But for now, we're ending our study in the next few weeks of Amos as we go through these last couple of chapters. So I uh, uh, thank you all for coming today. We have a great crowd, and let's go ahead and get started. So we have been in chapter 8. And we studied verses 8 through 14. And what I would like to do is to read to you from the Hebrew Amplified Version that I create by taking the King James Version and looking up the key words in the Hebrew and taking the meanings of those key words in the Hebrew and infusing them in or amplifying the King James text. So here you see it, the screen in blue letters is the actual uh, extraction from the internet of the King James Version. The black are the key words that I have taken out of the interlinear Hebrew from the internet as well and combined those together to give us a uh, an amplified text. So uh, if someone would like to read that, my voice is a little under the weather. I've been teaching all week to a class in Egypt from uh, 6 in the morning until around 11 o'clock. So my voice is, uh, I want to save it for the lesson. So if someone can help me with reading, that would be uh, appreciated. Can someone read from the screen the Amplified King James Hebrew Version? I can do that for you. Thank you. Amos 8, 8 through 9. Shall not the land tremble and quiver for this and everyone mourn and lament that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up and swell wholly as a flood, a ground wave, and it shall be cast out and heave up and down and be drowned and sink down and subside as by the flood, like the Nile of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause and order the sun to go down at noon, the sixth hour, and I will darken and diminish the light on the earth in that clear, cloudless day, the broad daylight. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful reading. So here we have in this passage a couple of very startling global events. <clears throat> we, well, what do you see? As from what we studied last week, what two global events are occurring here in this passage? Ryan, is your hand up? <laughs> no, this is like a flea market, Ryan, or an auction. I'm sorry, you got the bid. You raised your hand, sold. <laughs> All right. Does anyone want to tell me what you see here? Earthquake and I eclipse. Okay. A major earthquake and probably an eclipse. So we see uh, things occurring in the earth that people will take notice of. And we discussed that this passage is a description of a particular type of earthquake. Uh, there's really two main types, the kind that shake side to side and the kind that shake up and down. The ones that shake up and down require a lot more energy and expend a lot more energy and do a lot more damage. And we're looking at this and where it says in verse 8 that it shall be cast out and drowned. That is an expression in the Hebrew that means to heave up and down and to subside. And so we see that describing an earth wave, which is generated by this up and down type of fault called a dip-slip fault, which is very common in that area. And it's caused a major earthquake that has caused that heave movement these up and down events release tremendous energy and they release a wave in the land very much like a tsunami in the water. And so they do a tremendous amount of destruction. Uh, then we see this, it shall come to pass in that day that the sun will go down at noon, the sixth hour. 
And this could be a physical total eclipse of the sun. We just had an annular eclipse here a few days ago. The astronomical record shows us that two total solar eclipses did occur during Amos's lifetime, one in June 15th and another in February 9th. So we certainly see that these events were available there, that uh, they did occur during that period of time. Okay. However, students of the Bible recognize that there's more to verse 9 than simply a physical event. We also see here that this could be a reference, and I believe it is, to the supernatural darkening that occurred during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in Amos's future and our past. And that's recorded for us in Luke 23, verses 44 through 46. Now, let me, uh, let me read verse 9 from Amos first. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause and order the sun to go down at noon, the sixth hour, and I will darken and diminish the light on the earth in the clear cloudless day, the broad daylight. Now let's go to Luke 23, verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, noon, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. There's a reference to the earthquake, if you will. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost and died. So we see here God using natural events to demonstrate his power and his sovereignty. And the ninth verse and the eighth verse as well are showing us a messianic reference to things that would occur in the future of Amos. They are in our past, but also if you look into the far field beyond our time, we also have a reference here that in that day in verse nine, we might expect that during the latter days when Jesus returns, we know that there will be a great earthquake as well on the Mount of Olives, and it will split that Mount of Olives apart, and that there will be associated with that some darkness as well. So we see here the immediate prediction through Amos of a near-coming earthquake and darkening, and then a far field in the latter days as well. So it's a very, very interesting passage that we studied last week. Any questions about that before we move on? Okay. Can someone read for me? Or if you don't mind, Annette, if I can just stay with you as my reader, that would be convenient. Could you read for us from the screen, Amos 8, 10 through 13? <clears throat> Excuse me, yes. And I will turn and overthrow your feast and religious festivals into mourning and weeping for the dead and all your songs and joyful music, music into lamentations and songs of mourning. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter and hurtful day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but a hearing of the words of the Lord. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So in this passage, we see again a messianic reference to the mourning of an only son. And we see that this earthquake is going to cause a lot of death and destruction. And there's going to be a lot of weeping for the dead. Now, some people say this is also referring to the invasion that's coming from Assyria that is approaching Israel to take them away and deliver them to the north. So that is another application of this verse as well. But I think that a lot of the death and destruction that we see in Amos 8 is being caused by that earthquake as well. And, uh, and it tells us that many people will start to seek the Lord for guidance, for blessing, and for comfort. And we see here that uh, there's going to be a famine. That means there's going to be a shortfall of that. That that's not the Lord is not going to make himself available to the people at that time. 
So not only do we see the physical disaster, but we see the spiritual disaster of the Lord turning from the sin of the people as well. So we discussed that this hearing, this famine of hearing, when God withdraws his revelation, is that the words will no longer be there, even though the people will desperately seek them. And if we look at verses 12 through 14, Annette, if you could read again, please. And they shall wander and shake from sea to sea, and from the dark land of the north, even to the east, where the sun will rise, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and they shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgins, the beautiful brides, and young men in their prime faint and wilt for thirst of God's word. Okay, now again, this is again, we see messianic prophecy here. <coughs> Most of you are familiar with the uh, the uh, parable of the brides, uh, bride maids that are waiting in the chamber, and some <coughs> have their lamps full and others don't. And when the Lord arrives, some are ready and others have to go to fill their lamps. And while they're doing what they should have done already, the bridegroom comes and, and takes the bridesmaids away. And that already occurs and they miss it. And so it's interesting. I think that can correlate here as well. So they're going to wander and shake from sea to sea, from darkness to light, from the land of the north, which is considered the land of darkness, and the land in the east where the sun rises. And the sun, S-O-N, will also rise and be resurrected. <clears throat> so we see a very heavy messianic influence on these verses in Amos 8. Hey, John. Yes. Interestingly, I see sandwiched between the earthquake and the eclipse and down here the virgins, where you're going to mourn as for an only son. Yes. Interesting. Uh -huh. It very much is interesting. And if you... If you've read your Bible and you know the New Testament and then go back to the Old Testament and read this, it, it should be chilling to you because it shows you the, that this prophecy, this has been predicted for thousands of years. And, uh, and we see that here in Amos. Verse 14 says, They that swear an oath by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner and conduct of Beersheba, the well of oath, liveth, even they shall fall and be cast down and never rise up and stand alive again. So this is a reference, again, you have to recognize that in the city and land of Dan, Jeroboam has erected a golden calf. And the people, instead of going from Israel to Jerusalem to worship Jehovah God, they stop at the border at Dan and don't go any further and stop short of worshiping the true creator God and settle instead for a created God of gold, a golden calf that is in Dan. And even those religious people who appear to be religious are, are committing idolatry and worshiping a false god and that will not save them. They will be utterly destroyed and never rise up and stand alive again. And the well of oath at Beersheba, they would go to the well of oath and seek the revelation, the oracle of God. And we're told in the previous verses that there will be a famine of the word of God and Beersheba no longer will give them those oracles and revelations from God. So we see here the warning of the punishment is God will withdraw himself from the sin of the people. So this is a global message of chastisement and punishment. Now, remember, we've studied these two words and we recognize that. Well, let me ask you to see if you remember. What is the purpose of chastisement and what is it? To bring us back, to cause us to repent. Okay, it's to get our attention yeah, and to help us to recognize our sin and say, yeah. hey, look at here what God wants. Look at here what you've done. And I'm going to bring you hardship to get your attention so that hopefully you will repent 
and turn back to God. That's what chastisement is. Amen. What is punishment? That's a judgment. A yeah, judgment. you've crossed the line. Justice. And now yeah. you're going to be punished for it, and I will come and visit your sin with the just reward for that. Okay? So chastisement is actually an act of mercy. It's an attempt to restore. It's an attempt to call the people back by bringing them events that help them recognize what their blessings were and the punishment that stands in the future coming their way if they continue to be the sons and daughters of disobedience. So the chastisement, if that doesn't work, God says, okay, I've extended my mercy to you and you've slapped it away. The line is in the sand. You've crossed it. So now I will return and I will visit your sin, but no longer with chastisement, but with punishment. So we see that here in the contrast between these. Woe to those who are in Zion, proclaims the Lord in Amos 6. Woe to those who. Now, woe to those who are at ease in Zion. They think they're protected. They think their religion will save them. So they're in the mountain of God. They're in Zion. They're worshiping the way they want to worship not the way God has set up for them to worship, and they're at ease. And God proclaims woe to them. What does woe mean? Uh, disaster is coming. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It also is the word you give to a horse to tell him, stop the path you're oh, on. Amen. Whoa. Okay, that's kind of interesting as well. <laughs> Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory. They're enjoying the blessings of God, the material wealth that God has given them. <laughs> there are poor people and needy people starving and dying, and they're lying on beds of ivory. They stretch themselves out on their couches. They drink wine in bowls. They have such an abundance while there are the poor people there in great need, living day to day and moment to moment, these rich people anoint themselves with the finest oils that should be used to worship God, and instead they use them for their own pleasure. I'm sure you understand that back there they didn't have air conditioning, and they didn't have the cleanliness that we have today, so they really stink. And they didn't have the access to the water that we have today. So they didn't bathe very often. And it was a stinking world. It really reeked. And what they did is they used these oils and perfumes to cover up their bodily stench. And so instead of using the oils that were created to worship God, they're using them to cover up the stench of their own sin and their own depravity. Very interesting. Not only are God's people living in luxurious ease, but in their self-satisfied greed, they're failing to acknowledge God. Now, you can find this on page Amos 56. If you want to fill in these blanks, you can do that as I lecture this, and you can add these to your handouts. So they're at ease, they're comfortable that their religion is sufficient to continue to bring them the blessings of God. Oh, they've heard the prophets, that what's coming, and it hasn't come. And they've heard the prophets, and it hasn't come, and they've continued to sin. And they're continuing to sin. And in their luxurious ease, and in their self-satisfied greed, they're hoarding things for themselves and failing to acknowledge God for it's their prosperity that has caused them to forget God and to claim credit for their own wealth. And they're trampling on the needs of the poor and they're dealing deceitfully in their business practices and they're profaning the Sabbath to make even more money. And you can go back to Amos 8 verses 4 through 6 and see these things accounted for us. We've studied them in previous weeks. This is the temptation of the heart of flesh when prosperity comes. 
Richness in itself is not sin, but the temptation to replace God with that richness, the pride and the unhealthy offspring of pride, which is arrogance. I love that relationship between arrogance and pride, seeing arrogance as the unhealthy offspring that comes from pride. You think you're responsible for what you've accomplished, and you think you're responsible for your riches and your prosperity, and you don't realize that these are gifts from God given to you to be stewards of and to share with those who are in need. This is a temptation of the heart of flesh. And in their arrogance, they push aside the humility and the gratitude that should characterize God's holy people. This was the sin of Israel as they exploited the poor and the needy and sold them into slavery and sold a child for a pair of shoes. That is what they've done. And for that, they will be punished. Their humility and gratitude, which God wanted to see from them. Instead, they showed God pride and arrogance. And he said, I've brought you chastisement and you've ignored it and continued in your arrogance and your pride and refused to humble yourself before a holy God and refused to be gracious and thankful and acknowledge God as the source of your prosperity, of your health, of your riches, of all the things you enjoy. While material prosperity is a blessing from the Lord, and it can be appropriately earned by those who work diligently and wisely, an accumulation of wealth can lead to a variety of temptations. And that's the problem. When you start to rely on your wealth rather than on your God, and you acknowledge your wealth that you've created with your hands playing God. Material wealth should be received gratefully, but it must never displace God as the center of our affection and worship. The main practical way to keep wealth in its proper place. Now, this should interest all of you. What is the main practical way to keep wealth in its proper place? It's to be generous toward those who are in need. Help the needy. Help the poor. Share what God has given you with those who are not as fortunate. Especially in the light of the generosity and mercy that God has shown us in Christ. So you can read these other scriptures I've given you to further enrich your study here. But I hope you see the condemnation from Amos on Israel, that these people have enjoyed the blessing of God And when it comes to the part of their covenant contract to love your neighbor as yourself, as you enjoy your wealth, so should your neighbor enjoy that wealth. Love your neighbor as, in the same manner, you love yourself. If you buy one can of beans for yourself to eat and buy a cheaper can of beans for others to eat, is there a problem with that? Maybe, maybe it's interesting to think about. So there's a warning here for those who are blessed and for those who are wealthy. The main practical way to keep your wealth from owning you is to share it and give it away to others to help them as well. The food banks in your community should be full. If everyone who goes to church Sunday morning would go to the food bank on the way and drop off cans of food, it would feed the local poor. That's not the case, unfortunately, but it can be. 
the global message of Amos for today, I want to give you some personal food for thought. The prophetic words of Amos carries an urgent message. And that message is directed not only at Israel and Judah, but I believe at America and the Christian church today. Where God has brought us material blessing, those blessings need to be received gratefully and acknowledged as coming from God. The first thing is give the glory to God. Number one, recognize God as the source of your prosperity. You haven't earned it. You haven't deserved it. God has given it to you. Now, in the light of global needs and local needs, including extreme poverty, lack of clean water, malnutrition, inadequate basic medical care, the material blessings that we have should be shared with those who are in need. What were the people in Amos's day condemned for? They were taking advantage of the poor and needy instead of helping them. They were selling them into slavery. They neglected and even exploited them. They cheated them in business dealings. They lied to them. Such neglect received God's chastisement and correction. And when they failed to correct their course, judgment was delivered. See, God gives us a clock, and he gives us time, and along with that clock, he gives us a compass, which gives us a direction in which we should be going. When we ignore the compass and choose our own direction, that's a trespass, and God will tolerate that only for a certain amount of time. During that time, while we're ignoring the compass direction that he's leading us to go, he is sending chastisement and saying, pay attention to this. As we continue to ignore the chastisement, the time eventually runs out. And all that's left is the compass. And God comes and delivers his wrath according to his will and his word. And people will seek that word. And they will seek forgiveness. It will be too late. There will be a famine of the word of God in the land. And I believe we're so near to that. America and the church must stop presuming that God will continue to tolerate their disobedience and rejection forever. It isn't going to happen. He will deal in perfect justice with those who claim his love and compassion, but don't show it to others. They fail to extend that love and compassion to love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your strength and might and soul and heart. Yes, yes, number one. Number two, take care of your neighbor the way you take care of yourself. That isn't happening. John, can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Yeah, I think the biggest problem in America is not food. I mean, we have an abundance. It's spiritual poverty. Okay. We're feeling. Okay. Good. So not only do we have to share a can of beans, a can of scripture would help too. Yes. Good. Large, large size. All those who have been shown mercy, are we loving our neighbors with the agape love that Jesus Christ has shown us? That's a question we should ask ourselves every day when we wake up. And we thank God for another day to bring glory to him, to recognize him as our Lord and God, to receive his love and his mercy and his grace, and to take that love and that mercy and that grace to a world that is dying. That's the spiritual food that you've just talked about. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. So I give you this message as a food for thought. 
This is where America and the church is today, at a crossroads. Let's read Matthew 25, 40. The king shall answer and say unto them, <clears throat> Verily, I say unto you, <clears throat> Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, the poor and the needy, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, a naked, and ye clothed me not, needy and poor, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered or a thirst? or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. Then he shall answer them, saying, Verily, verily, truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, the poor and needy, you did it not to me. Hey, John, is one other side of the coin. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. One other side of the coin is if you give them too much, you spoil them. God uh, God expects us to work for our food, and I think we have a big welfare problem with a lot of people that are too lazy to work. And God says, if you don't work, you don't eat. But isn't that the problem of the person that's receiving and not the problem of the person who's to give? Exactly. Okay. All right, great discussion. Anyone else want to join the discussion? John, I, I, as a young man, uh, uh, live by a saying and still do, but I'm beginning to understand it. And the saying is simply this, everything you own, owns you. And I thought I owned a lot of things until in the last few years, I realized I don't own anything. God owns it all. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. And what I have is given to me. You know, I'm the guy in the bread line. And unless God gives it to me, I don't have it. And I've learned that. And I'll tell you what, it brings to mind the scripture that says, uh, help me, let me help you bear your burdens. You know, take my yoke upon you. It's, it's light and easy. And if you give God all the things that you possess, let him take care of them, you'll be far better off. I, I can tell you that from experience. All right. Thank you, Herb. Anyone else have anything they want to say? So I heard another voice. Collins has his hand up. Go ahead. John, you used the word agape uh, in reference to uh, the uh, if you will, love of man and caring for man. I'd like to uh, put a little more refinement on that, if you will. Go ahead. There's the difference between agape and filio or phila uh, love uh, goes back, if you will, to the Greek. And uh, agape love may be considered the highest form of love or charity, and that being the love of God for man and man for God. Whereas filial love is love of self or love of brother. And I think that we uh, ought not to use agape love for brotherly love. I think we know is I think there is a distinction and that's not to say that we, you know, uh, should not love our brother, but we should not love our brother in the way that we love God. Those are just some insights on the Greek uh, and the dis slight distinction between God and brother. Yeah, and Collins, I, can I add to that a little bit and, 
just to get your feedback. Uh, I don't think we love our brother as we love God. Uh, I think God is one and our spouse is next and then our brother family. You, you can rank that down as far as priorities. But the I think agape love, in, in my view, is a selfless love. And agape love is putting your neighbor's needs ahead of your needs, where I think philea is a brotherly love. It's loving a brother because you have things in common. You love the fellowship with one another and things like that. So I do think we are directed to use agape love towards other people. And that's being putting yourself underneath them and doing and going towards their needs first. And that's the real difficult part is when you serve someone else for what they need and you don't serve yourself. I think that's the difference. If you go to Mark 12, um, verses 30 and 31, you'll see that when Jesus is saying that we are to love God um, with our soul and heart, that's the first commandment. He uses agape. And then when you go to verse 31 and he says, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, he uses agape again. Amen. He does. And if you yep. will turn to Philippians chapter two, beginning with verse five, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name in which every other name that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. I think we're being taught by the Bible that our goal is to love our neighbors with agape love, right. with the sacrificial love. There will be a time coming in the apostasy and the end times. And I think this verse, Matthew 25, verse 40, comes right out of the tribulation when the church is being persecuted and those who believe in Christ are fleeing into the countryside. And there are others who claim to be brethren and they're turning those people away and turning them into the authorities. And I think we're seeing that in these scriptures that we are called to risk our own lives for those of others. And I, I respect everything that's been said here in the last few minutes and the distinction between the two loves. But I think we are called to have agape love for our brothers. It's not just phileo love. John Aarons has his hand up. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, my understanding of agape love is unconditional. Unconditional love. Okay. Uh, so God has the unconditional love for us and, and we in turn should have unconditional love for him. Now, whether that passes across to our neighbors, uh, I guess it, it does. Okay. Anyone else? I, I want to just change the subject just a second, unless somebody's got something else on that. But go ahead. What, what strikes me here, John, and I don't know whether people pick it up, is you talked about pride and arrogance and humility and gratitude and any reference Philippians uh, with with uh, with Christ being humbled until death. And we're obviously, you know, we're in a book of James right now when we, we covered this uh, pretty extensively. But I didn't recognize until we got into this study deeply how pride and arrogance is so distasteful to our Lord. I couldn't even imagine how much he is against it. And to the point that if you have pride or arrogance, you don't have God's grace. He withholds the grace to the proud and the arrogant, but he gives his grace more to the humble. And so this pride and arrogance thing, look, when you look at the Old Testament, 
I'm not quite counting the New Testament. When you look at the Old Testament, there's hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of verses that are around pride and, and being humble. Mm -hmm. And it is so important that we are humble. You can't give to your neighbors yourself if you're proud and arrogant. You can't, it's impossible. It's humanly impossible. You have to be humbled and brought down to the layer of a servant in order to be able to give your neighbor with a, any type of agape love. So I just wanted to point that out is that the God really has a distaste and it, I've watched it. And so I don't know whether you can see me, but I used to watch a lot of sports. I don't anymore. I'm more into the Bible than watching sports. Not that sports are bad. It's just my time is dedicated differently. But you know, I used to watch what happened when, whether it was football, basketball, or whatever, the person gets into the end zone. And you have three things that happen. They don't do anything or they celebrate. And when they celebrate, it's two ways. Me, me, me. Or they celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, God. If you watch an athlete and they have success, watch what they do with that success. Do they recognize it came from God or do they recognize they did it on his own? And also why I'm pointing that out because every time I saw an athlete that did it, that beat their chest instead of honored God, the team lost in the end. <laughs> I'll rest my case. Okay. So let's circle back around here mm -hmm. and, and, wrap up this this section and this message and i want to refer all of you you can read it on your own but it's very important that you do this please i want you to read john chapter 21 verses 15 through 18 and in that passage you're going to find a discussion between jesus and one of his disciples concerning the difference between phileo love and agape love. Let that passage sort it out for you. And you will see that Jesus is asking Simon Peter for agape love. And Simon at first is only willing to offer phileo love. And Jesus says, you will eventually come around. And you will eventually know that what I desire and require of you is agape love. So that's a passage I refer you to. So let's, let's wrap this piece up this way. I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. The something I ought to do, I can do. And by the grace of God, I will do it. These words were spoken by Edward Everett Hail. Now, the word hail might be a memory in some of your minds. This individual was an American author and historian, a minister. He wrote a book, The Man Without a Country. He is the grand nephew of Nathan Hale, who was an American spy during the Revolutionary War. And he recognized that a single person cannot change the world. But a single person can help his neighbor. And I think that's a really important message that Amos is giving to Israel. Israel, it's that simple. You exploited the needy. You put the poor into slavery. They didn't have food to eat. You laid down on an ivory couch. God doesn't respect that. In your pride and arrogance, he wants you to humble yourself, recognize him. And not only is agape love, unconditional love, it's also sacrificial love. And I prefer this word. Agape love is complete love. Phileo love goes so far. Brotherly love. I love you as a brother. I love you, but 
will I risk my own life, not phileo love, but agape love will. So that's chapter eight. Does anyone have any questions or any other comments? We've had a great discussion today about a very important subject about being, rather than being proud and arrogant as the world teaches us to be. You know, David, the world teaches those athletes to celebrate in that end zone. No. The world honors that. The secular world exalts that rather than thanking God. in. And some snicker when that player references God or crosses himself. They snicker, and, oh, he's one of them. He's a Tim Tebower, something like that. Right. Okay. And we need to recognize, we know what side of that coin we need to be representing. And we need to be about it. And I love this little quote here from Edward Everett Hale. It's so simple. I'm one. And I'm valuable. Because as one, I can make a change. I can do something for at least one other. And if one reaches one and each one reaches one, the mechanism works and it lives. And by the grace of God, I will do it. See how he credits God? That's humility. Okay. Anything else on Amos chapter 8? Well, I'm, I'm going to make a statement that this is America and just what I see. And I, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I'm going back to you your warning against America, John, is what I see in America today is not all, but a lot of our leadership in America are these people taking advantage of the poor. They're on their rivalry couches. They're doing very well while our poor and actually middle to lower middle are having problems just buying food today because the inflation is so out of out of, out of reach. At the same time, our government is not hurting at all. At the same time, not all in the government, we have some good people there, so don't get me wrong. But when I looked at we're giving billions of dollars to someone who doesn't support God, our God, or Christianity, and someone who is completely against Israel in every shape, fashion, or form, it makes no sense what America is doing today. And I think what, what you're saying in Amos, you can picture this going on in America, but a little bit different than the days of Amos. But it is so, I think, black and white what's going on between the two things here. Now, just say that it's my opinion. It doesn't mean it's true. It's just as I, I perceive it. And I'll rest it at that. All right. Thank you. OK, so let's let's move on with that last word on Amos 8, and move into Amos chapter 9. And hey, this John. is our... Yes? Yeah, real quickly, Mother Teresa said, I can do things you can't do. You can do things I can't do, but together we can do great things. Well, and, and, and what I would add, what John Drippus would add to that is, you can't do what I can do, and I can't do what you can do, so we better do it. Yes. Do it. <laughs> do it don't talk about it do it all oh, right like hale's approach but by the grace of god i will do it yep that's <laughs> I like right the quote amos chapter 9 is the final chapter within this book and he ends on a high note and when we look at this chapter we see that it brings to us several themes it talks about the punishment, and the demolition of the cities. And as this wonderful thing that man has made with his hands is destroyed by the power of God and demolished, the people realize there's nowhere to hide. When you're a sinner in the hands of an angry God, and he's given you an opportunity and you continually reject it and push him aside. And the time for chastisement is over. And the day of punishment has arrived. There is nowhere to hide. 
we're going to see that earthquake of God again, and we're going to see this process as a sifting of the people, a separating of the people. But then Amos turns, and he says, yes, there is justice, and an eye for an eye will occur, but there's hope. And he talks about rebuilding the nation and restoring the people to the land. And we will see that at the end of Amos chapter 9. So let's go there, and let's look at the chapter as a unit, as is my practice, and then we're going to take this apart and put it into pieces that we're going to study over the next few weeks. The first passage here, chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. Can someone read that for me, please? <laughs> Annette, if you're still up for it, if you'd read that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with a sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, hence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, hence will I bring them down. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence I will command the serpent, and he shall bite them. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. Wow. Okay. That's just the first four verses. And what a lot is there. And what does it basically say? What is the theme here of this section? Nowhere to hide. Yeah, you can run, but you can't hide. No, you won't run, Jonah, judgment. run, but you can't get away. All right, exactly. He's going to smite the lintel of the door that the posts may shake. Then shall mine hand take them and bring them down. I will search and take them out. I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. What we see here is vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's how I've titled this piece, these first four. And we're going to look at the subject of vengeance and what it is and whose responsibility it is and isn't. Because in our pride and arrogance, often we push God aside and decide we are going to be the vengeful one, and that's not our job. And we'll talk about that during this passage. So that'll be an interesting lesson. Demolition is where he's going to smite the lintel of the door that the posts may shake. You hear the earthquake? See the earthquake again? Okay, you can see it there. All right. There's nowhere to hide, whether you go up or down or side to side. Though they hide, he will search out and take them. You cannot hide from God. Okay, let's stop there, and we'll pick up next week. Now, I am going to have to be gone in the coming weeks on November 4th. Okay, I will not be here, so that's a couple weeks into the future. If, if any of you uh, has an interest in sharing a message, and you have a little bit of time, I'm warning you, far ahead of time, you can talk to, to Barry. He is the one who really runs the study, so he's the one who will give the yay or nay on anyone else having this position to teach to the group. So if any of you have anything that you want to share as a lesson, please talk to Barry about it in the next week or so, and I'll continue to remind you. But I'm not going to be here on the, uh, on the 4th of November. I am going to... Uh, uh, attend my grandson's birthday party in Washington, D.C. on that day. My grandson. Hey, yes. The fourth, I think, is a Saturday, isn't it? Is it the third? I'm, I'm sorry. It's the third. Okay. Just to it's the third. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's just to third. clarify, too, because sometimes there's a little confusion when we put this out there. John is not asking for somebody to continue in Amos. It would be something completely separate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So does anyone have any final word? We've got a couple minutes left. 
been a great lesson for discussion and participation, and I appreciate those who shared. It's also been a great lesson. I hope it's motivated you. I hope the Hale quote has helped you some too. You're valuable. You're precious to God. And he has equipped you with abilities and gifts. And you need to recognize that and acknowledge God. And God wants to work with you and help you to develop those gifts to love your neighbor as yourself and to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul. And this has been a great message today. And I hope it has encouraged you and that you will take it and you will, whatever it is, whatever that thing is, that you will do it and that you will move forward acknowledging God, set pride and arrogance aside, and move forward in his will, bringing glory and honor to him. Does anyone have any final word before we close in prayer? Can I have someone close us in prayer, please? Ryan, thank you. Go ahead, Ryan. Father, we just thank you so much uh, for your word. And we pray that there would not be a famine of your word, that your Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit would give us insight and direction and knowledge of you, your word. Father, we thank you for John and his teaching. Uh, keep his voice strong for his other studies. And we pray now for, for the peace of Jerusalem. Um, we ask that you bless your people and keep America um, on the right path in blessing Israel as well. And uh, as the earlier verse of Philippians said, um, we should not only look out for our own interests, but also the interests of others. And we pray that we would uh, be concerned with the welfare of others. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen.